Okay, everyone. Gold watches making a comeback, and this is a natural progression within the watch world trends. For the past few years, the Gente-inspired integrated steel sports watches blew up. The unfinished, raw, tooly nature of the watch made it appealing for those looking to get their hands on a respected luxury watch that could still be worn on a daily basis without turning heads. Quiet luxury. Something that has a state-of-the-art movement gracefully beating inside with an intricate dial work, but still appears understated to the non-watch people. But then the 80s happened, and the money came pouring in. Luxury was no longer quiet, it was loud, it was flashy. And what better way to show off this newfound wealth than with an eye-catching yellow gold watch? Besides watch cases becoming smaller in size, Recently, we've been noticing more and more watch brands offering gold variants among their most popular offerings. And in a way, it makes sense. What comes after steel, ceramic, titanium, and carbon when considering case materials? There has to be a definitive shift in style that says, this is the new thing, and gold seems to be that shift. A gold watch is now worn for its visual appeal instead of status. And what happens when you remove status? All that remains is style. And this is exactly where these affordable gold tone watches enter the scene. Look at the new Seiko 5s, look at Tissot's PRX, Orient Bambino, G-Shocks, and even some micro brands like Brew and Baltic are getting on this trend, taking at least one of their popular models and offering a gold tone version of it. But since it's not real gold, how will these age? That's a common question that a lot of people ask. To answer that, just Google any vintage gold-plated watch like this Omega Seamaster from the 60s. This is how it ages. It has this slight warm pinkish hue, and I love that. Within the three new watches in the PVD Gold collection, we are looking at two of them here, the MR01 and the Bicompax 002. Both of these come in PVD coated 316L stainless steel cases with the MR01 coming in at a case diameter of 36 millimeters, a thickness of just under 10 millimeters, a lug to lug of 44 and a lug width of 20 millimeters. But the bicompacts were slightly larger at 38 millimeters with a thickness of 13 millimeters, a lug to lug of 47 and a lug width of 20. Both feature drilled lug holes, which make it easy to replace straps and bracelets that don't come with quick release spring bars. The finishing is ever so slightly different between these two. While both feature a mixture of brushed and polished finishing, the MR01 certainly feels dressier, with both the bezel and the top of the lugs highly polished, and just the midsection of the case sides brushed. In the case of the Bicompacts, the lugs are brushed all the way through with the polishing surface being limited to just the upper layer of the step bezel. The Bicompacts features a signed crown that helps separate it from the chronograph pushers at 2 and 4, whereas the MR01 is a bit more minimalist with an unsigned polished crown. Both the watches come with a pushful crown with the Bicompax offering a slightly higher water resistance of 50 meters compared to MR01's 30 meters. Although this shouldn't make much of a difference since neither of these watches are meant to be worn in a pool, both watches feature glossy black tiles that almost mimic enamel. But in person, the MR01 appears darker and clearer. Both watches have applied Arabic numerals with MR01 resembling Breguet font, again making it appear dressier, and the Bicompacts having a more modern style. The MR01 features a gold railroad minute track along the edges, which contrasts really well against the black backdrop, in addition to a radially textured sub-seconds register that separates itself from the rest of the glossy dial. The chronograph is quite similar to the MR01 in that regard, with a similar circular brush registers, but this time intended for the chronograph function. The leaf style hands are well finished, they look polished and clean, but one thing I noticed when seeing both of these watches side by side is that Baltic used wider hands on the MR01 to compensate for the emptiness of the dial, and the slimmer hands on the busier chronograph dial of the Bicompax. That is some impressive attention to detail. 
And just like the steel versions, these gold-plated variants do not feature loom. Which, in a way, is good because adding a touch of loom on those faceted hands would just kill that elegant look. No, I don't think there's any need to confuse the watch. Both watches feature domed acrylic crystals, which tend to be easier to scratch than sapphire, but micro scratches can easily be buffed out using something like poly watch. But sapphire isn't always the most obvious choice. The visual distortion that a domed acrylic crystal creates on a watch cannot be replicated by sapphire. An untrained eye might not notice the difference, but a seasoned collector might feel that the sapphire crystal looks too clinical on an otherwise vintage looking watch. I mean, think about it. That's why you still have the Hazelite variant available on a $5,000 Speedmaster. It's not because they're trying to save a few bucks. It's because it looks true to the now vintage Speedy. Through the exhibition case packs, you can see the decorated calipers. The MR01 uses the automatic Hangzhou Microrotor Caliber 5000A, offering a high beat rate of 28,800 vibrations per hour and 42 hours of power reserve. The micro rotor allows the watch to have an automatic winding system with unobstructed view of the inner workings on the movement, all while keeping the overall thickness of the case at a minimum. On the other hand, the Bicompax gets its power from a manual wind ST1901 column wheel chronograph caliper by Seagull. This caliber also offers 42 hours of power reserve, but a slower beat rate of 21,600 vibrations per hour. Now, there is some controversy when it comes to these calibers. Are they serviceable? Yes. But in the case of the ST1901, it might be cheaper to replace the movement inside altogether instead of servicing it because of the level of complexity that comes in a mechanical column wheel chronograph movement. Like the Powermatic 80, these are well-made movements. They're not gonna break easy, but these are entry-level calibers made to do heavy lifting. Now, why would you choose these movements instead of the Japanese Miyota or Seiko's legendary NH35? Because in the case of these watches, the brand wouldn't be able to create an affordable column wheel chronograph function at this price. They wouldn't be able to offer a micro-order caliber at this price. These watches are a step higher than your basic three-handed movements at the entry level. I don't think a gold watch will ever overtake the versatility that comes with a steel watch. Even with the rise of titanium, ceramic, gold, and carbon cases, stainless steel remains the all-time favorite for the vast majority of collectors. But while gold tone watches would have looked too flashy, too polarizing, or even outdated around even three years ago, they've made a comeback. And I'm sure that many other entry to mid-range brands are working on their own gold tone variants of their popular watches. Anyway, these are just my personal thoughts. Don't kill me in the comments, but do let me know what you think. I want to know your thoughts. And hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, do subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.